You'll remember several weeks ago, I talked about how we're entering a time of transition, but that doesn't mean that we're entering a time of complacency, right? Now is not the time to rest, but now is the time more than ever to be active in mission, to be active in our purpose of love and service. Uh, and so that's why we've had this three-week emphasis. You're recognizing this image now. This is our, our third week in this this emphasis on service and mission, go. So the first week we looked at the Great Commission. Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world, baptizing, teaching them. Then last week we looked at, well, how does that actually work? How, how does that look more concretely? And we looked at the instruction to the disciples given in Matthew chapter 10 of go, uh, take nothing with you, no money, no bag, no shoes, no staff, because you're going not to give gifts, but to give of yourself, right? That was the message last week. So today, we continue the, this theme of go, but this is, I think, the most important one of all, because we get here quite literally to the heart of the matter. We come to the issue of your heart. You see, because you cannot love and serve effectively, in fact, you cannot love and serve at all unless you allow God to take from you your cold heart of stone and replace it with his own sacred heart of flesh. This is what the Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel, a new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall be my people and I will be your God. But God can't replace our heart of stone when we are clinging to it. We have to let go. So today we're taking that theme of go and sort of turning it on its head. Originally I was going to uh, entitle this message, first we had go and then go and give, and today was going to be go and die. And then I realized that without proper context that sounds really ter terrible. So, uh, so today's message is let go. Let go. And much the same meaning, right? We have to let go of our hearts. We have to let go of our lives. We have to let go of those things that we cling to in order for God to give us new life. And this turning over of our hearts to God, this is what is traditionally called repentance, right? Repentance is this turning over of ourselves. And so in order to provoke us, provoke us to repentance, God will often send prophets Prophets who shake us out of our complacency. Prophets who, prophets who give us words, strong words, unflinching words of rebuke. Words like we find in the third chapter of Matthew's Gospel, where John the Baptist says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, and every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather the wheat into the granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. See, those are the words of a prophet because those are the words of repentance. But these kinds of messages aren't popular these days, right? We don't like to hear messages of condemnation. We don't like to have God give us this ultimatum. But sometimes we need that. Not always, but sometimes. Because in the end, God is asking us to let go. And I was thinking about this the other day, that, you know, sometimes if a jar is on too tight, a glass jar, right? If it's on too tight, what can you do to loosen it? If it's gripping too tight, what can you do? 
a few different things. You can hit it or whatever, but you can use hot, you can heat it up, right? Because in the heat, it expands and it lets go. And so I think in, in this kind of analogous way, sometimes we need a little bit of hellfire to loosen our grip on life, to be willing to let go of those things that we cling to. So in order to remind us of the seriousness and the urgency of mission, Jesus says here in Matthew chapter 10, after he's given this instruction to the disciples, he gives these, this stark word of warning. Everyone who acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Now, what does it mean that Christ will acknowledge us before his Father, but that Christ will claim us as his brothers and sisters, thereby confirming our adoption as children of God? Remember, we discussed this a couple weeks ago, uh, that only Jesus Christ is the Son of God by birth, right? He is God's only Son, but through his Spirit, we are invited to participate in his sonship, thereby becoming his brothers and sisters, right? So we become children of God because Christ has claimed us as his own siblings. That is our adoption. As it says in the letter to the Hebrews, the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call us, what, brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus uh, immediately then explains that bearing witness to him, confessing him before men, entering into his family will mean leaving your earthly family behind. That's why he says, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be the members of one's own household. And this sounds very harsh, but the truth is these aren't even the harshest words of Jesus on this very topic, as many of you know. Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Why does Jesus target the family in this way? Why is he, in his own words, wielding a sword of division to divide a family against itself? This is very surprising, very uh, unexpected. But you see, in this context, the family is simply an extension of one's own ego. Sometimes our own pride and our own egocentrism can masquerade as selflessness because we're doing good for others, but really it's just an extension of self-service. Does that make sense? So should we love our families? Of course. Should we love our families most of all? Yes. But it is a product of our sinful nature that our love becomes disordered and competitive. And it remains a matter of us versus them. Let me give you an example. Think about any of those mafia movies that you've ever seen. And, and what's the mafia always about, right? Family. Now, everyone in the family could be individually selfless, right? No one is looking out for themselves as individuals, but what do we see in a family like this that flaunts its wealth and abuses its power for selfish gain? It's not that the individual members are selfish, but that they are engaging in a collective selfishness. See? So sometimes our selfishness is not just about ourselves, but us looking out for our own, right? Now this can happen in a family. This can happen even in a church congregation, right? 
that we as a church maybe start thinking of ourselves as competing against other churches rather than building each other up. And perhaps this kind of collective selfishness is nowhere more apparent than in uh, the nation, right? This is where we worship ourselves. We engage in a collective narcissism. You know, I really enjoy the Olympics or the World Cup because this is the one place where I feel like it's totally appropriate to cheer for your country to beat another country, right? Because it's, we're just friend, it's just a game, right? Just a friendly rivalry. But, you know, some of us, many of us are sports fans, so we love that rivalry, we love that competition. But when it starts becoming a matter of life and death, and people are being killed because of their favorite sports team, we would know this has gotten out of hand, right? So the idea that American lives would be any more valuable than any other life is nothing but evil. And the idea that people born or living within these arbitrary borders are somehow more deserving of something than people outside, there's nothing righteous about that. It's idolatry. Now, if you have a hard time accepting that, the bad news is, is that Jesus has just gotten started. Because he says, not only do you have to hate your family, not only is he cutting you away from your natural ties, but he says you have to let go, not just of your family, but of your very life. Let go of your very self. He says, whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. As I've said many times, and I'll say again in no uncertain terms, despite what you may have been told, the cross is not a symbol of what God has done in your place. Christ does not die instead of you. The call of Scripture from beginning to end is an invitation for us to come and die with him. When we see Christ on the cross, we do not see simply what could have been. Oh, that could have been me up on that cross. I think that's how we usually are taught to think of it. When we look at Jesus on the cross, we don't see what could have been, but we see what must be. Jesus does not suffer and die so that we can then, in exchange, live a life of comfort and ease. We are called to participate in Christ's sacrifice, to offer up our own bodies, even, even to the point of death. Five times in the Gospels, five times, Jesus repeats this same call to take up the cross and follow him. And as the Apostle Peter writes, to this you were called, because Christ suffered for you. True? Christ suffered for you. But, what's the, but then what's the point of that? Well, what's the result of that? Christ suffered for you, Peter says, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And the Apostle John echoes the same message. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Amen? And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. You see how that works? The cross is not something that happens instead of our sacrifice. The cross itself is an invitation to you to come and participate in that sacrifice. We are called by God to go and be crucified with Christ. Because in order to be who God has called us to be, we must let go. We must let go of our own pursuits, our own schemes and dreams, our own wants and wishes. We must consider our old self as dead. We must let go of that stony heart so that Christ can give us his heart of flesh. So I wonder then, why don't we for instance, pray more. 
Why don't we pray more? Because we're clinging to other things. Our time, our thoughts are occupied with other things. I wonder how many of us, the first thing we do when we wake up in the morning is look at our phones, right? Why? Because we are clinging to life rather than our first thought in the morning being to turn our heart toward God. Productivity and entertainment. Productivity and entertainment. Think about that. Those are the two gods of our culture. Productivity and entertainment. But we have to let go of those idols. We have to let go of the need to always be entertained. And we have to let go of the need to always be productive. So why don't we love more? Why don't we serve more? We say that's the mission of the church, but you realize that's, that's you. That's who you are. This is not the mission of what we do when we come together. To love and to serve is the mission of your life. So why don't we do it more? Because we cling to other things. Because we fill our time with work and play. But the Lord is asking us today to let go to let go of our wants and desires, our aspirations, nail them to the cross, to take your stony heart and give it to Jesus. So again, I urge you, I urge you, as I will continue to do, that we must be active in service. I urge you to stop by the hostess desk on your way out. See, now we're making it a little more difficult for you. You have to, you have to step out, right? not just handing them to you. But God is calling to each one of us to let go of those things in life that we cling to. Because we say, oh, I don't have time for those things. But why don't you have time for them? Because you're clinging to your own life. But here's the good news. Jesus says, those who find their life will lose it, but those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Those who cling tightly to life, those who live life for themselves, those who try to live life on their own terms will not have life at all, Jesus says. And why? Because in the big picture of things, your life, your successes, whatever you think your life is going to amount to, however long you live, however full of joy or pain your life is, what difference is it going to make? This is in some ways, I think, the message of the book of Ecclesiastes, right? Your life is meaningless. And we have to come to that point. We have to come to that realization. That's, that's the one thing that will get us to let go, is to realize that there's nothing that you could ever do that will really matter. But... If you let go of that pitiful thing that you're clinging to, your own wants and wishes and dreams and desires, if you let go of those things, then Christ will be living in you. And what sort of life could be more fulfilling? What sort of life could be more meaningful than to be one through whom Christ has lived. You see, to be crucified with Christ brings tremendous freedom because all of those things in life that we cling to, that we obsess over, they end up controlling us. They end up owning us and dictating our life to us. But when we offer up our lives in sacrifice, we have nothing more to fear, nothing to be anxious about. No obligation but to love and to serve.